Hi guys, welcome to the fifth installment of our church history class and today we're going to be looking at some really familiar faces, some really familiar names. It's really remarkable to think about the fact that these guys were all alive at the same time period. And so, uh, you know, you might be familiar with the name Henry VIII, King Henry VIII. Um, there's, there's a few songs floating around about him, uh, but maybe you didn't know that he was alive at the same time as Martin Luther. And that when Martin Luther um, uh, nailed the 95 Thesis and he starts promoting uh, and, uh, you know, this doctrine that really takes Europe by storm uh, and, and the, the Reformation movement starts as people uh, sense that they're um, being freed from, you know, the shackles of, uh, of, of, of living a, a life of salvation by works and, and see that grace is kind of delivering them and setting them free and that really their salvation is based upon the work of Christ on the cross. Henry VIII wrote a, a, a refutation of Martin Luther's um, uh, doctrines. Uh, he wrote it, it was called uh, The Defense of the Seven Sacraments. He wrote it in 1521. And it was so uh, well written that Pope Leo X declared Henry VIII to be a defender of the faith. Like that's like an official title, uh, which is really uh, amazing when you think about what happened about 10 years later. So let me give you a little background and insight into Henry VIII. Um, he had uh, married Catherine of Aragon, uh, who was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabel, uh, the king and queen of Spain that had sent Christopher Columbus uh, uh, across the, the, the ocean. And so um, they were staunchly Catholic. If you remember, Isabella was also um, uh one that brought back the Inquisition and, and revitalized the Inquisition in Spain and kind of um, put it on steroids in, in Spain. And so their daughter, Catherine of Aragon, was married to Henry VIII's brother for a, a short amount of time. He died. And, and now Henry VIII, who was very concerned with the, cons the consolidation of power and, uh, and securing uh, power and authority for himself, uh, he now said, well, I think the best way to do this is for me to marry Catherine of Aragon, who was his sister-in-law, technically. And so he needed to ask permission of the Pope uh, to, to marry her. So he did. And he received permission to marry her. And then she only uh, bore him uh, daughters, so or, or a daughter. So then he, he decided that, um, you know, he, he wanted to set her aside. Um, the Catholic Church uh, didn't uh, have a divorce, so the solution that he had was annulment, and he had to have special permission from the Pope to annul the marriage, which is um, to say the marriage never should have taken place. It never took place. It's, it's undone as if it was never uh, there. So he wanted the Pope that he uh, petitioned, he petitioned for this marriage, to get special permission for the marriage. Now he wanted to say, um, no, I, I, you should annul the marriage. It never should have taken place in the, fir uh, in the first place because she's my sister-in-law. And, and technically, you know, I, I probably, that's probably not an official marriage. And he wanted the Pope to approve that. So he sends a message to uh, Pope Clement VII um, in Rome requesting to be uh, uh, having this marriage annulled. Now, at the moment in which Clement VII receives this request, uh, Clement VII is surrounded by the armies of Charles V, who is the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, the lady that he's trying to uh, undo the marriage of. So the Pope here is imprisoned in his own castle, surrounded by the armies of the nephew of the person that is requesting to have this marriage annulled. And so um, Clement VII has, is, is a little disinclined to give him permission to, um, uh, to have this marriage annulled. And so he, he denies the request. So Henry VIII has to find another way. Uh, here's what he does. As he's traveling through England, uh, he meets a young priest named Thomas Cranmer. And uh, they happen to meet. Uh, Thomas Cranmer comes to visit uh, a, an area in which Henry VIII is. 
and they somehow end up talking and Henry VIII is so impressed with Thomas Cranmer's reasoning and logic, the way that he kind of um, rationalized, if you will, the dissolution of this marriage, that he commands that Thomas Cranmer write a treatise uh, about uh, how um, Henry VIII should have permission <laughs> to uh, have this marriage annulled to Catherine of Aragon. And he appoints this priest to be his ambassador to Europe. So now he sends Thomas Cranmer uh, to Europe. And while he's uh, in Europe and traveling through Germany, uh, he meets a uh, Thomas Cranmer meets a reformer called Andreas uh, Osiander. And he's very impressed with him. Um, and he's very impressed with his niece um, and his doctrine, and, and uh, but also his niece. And so he, uh, he marries uh, his niece. And, uh, but he does so secretly because he's still technically uh, under a vow of celibacy that he took as a, as a priest. Um, but he, he marries her secretly um, and, uh, and then he comes back to England. Um, when uh, Clement refuses Henry's request, uh, Henry then declares himself to be the head of the church in England. And he uses Thomas Cranmer's rationale, which is what we would call royal absolutism, which is basically the, the thinking that God appointed a king and the king has the responsibility, the authority from God to lead over the country and the church of the country. That was the rationale, the thinking of Thomas Cranmer and, uh, and the... the um, uh, the doctrine under which Henry VIII kind of uh, separated himself from the Roman Catholic Church. He says, well, the Pope is no longer the authority over our church here. We disagree on moral grounds. Here is my rationale. And I am now the head of the church. So now I, you know, I Henry VIII, can determine whatever I want uh, to be uh, right or wrong um, within, uh, within the church, within the church in my country. And when the, uh, the elderly Archbishop of Canterbury dies, Thomas Cranmer is appointed as the new Archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, he immediately declares Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon uh, to be annulled. It, it never should have taken place. And, and he uh, also approves of his marriage to his mistress, Anne Boleyn, which had some leanings towards Protestantism herself. And was also very, very outspoken. She and uh, Cranmer got along very well. So um, throughout the reign of Henry VIII, uh, it would seem as though uh, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, uh, to my observation, again, I, I always hesitate to make these kind of declarations about people that I've never known personally. But just, you know, even just looking at the account, it seems to me as though he, he seems to exist and have a position just to authorize and validate uh, whatever uh, Henry VIII wants authorized and validated. Um, and, and, you know, maybe I should, I should show him a measure of, of, uh, of consideration. Maybe uh, like, say, for example, Zwingli, maybe Cranmer really did believe in, 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 in the, the absolute authority of, of royalty. And so then when he would petition uh, or disagree with or protest against one of the things or some of the things that uh, Henry VIII would would declare that he had to command and authorize as the as a, a, a church leader, um, maybe uh, he believed that he had a responsibility to yield and submit in those things to the authority of the king. I don't know, but he seems to kind of exist just a kind of rubber stamp, uh, spiritually rubber stamp. Uh, whatever uh, Henry VIII wanted uh, rubber stamped from the church. Um, uh, he would protest privately. He would vocalize uh, times that he disagreed, um, but he would always come down on the matter supporting whatever Henry VIII commanded that he support. Um, when he dies, when Henry VIII dies and his son, Edward VI, uh, takes the throne, uh, Edward is far more... Uh, leaning towards Protestantism than Henry was, um, it would seem as though, I, I say these kinds of, you know, words, it would seem as though, because I, I who knows, I, I don't know the heart, right? 
but it would seem as though uh, Henry's VIII's relationship to the church was one of convenience. You know, there was a time where he walked back his Protestantism and tried to go towards the Catholic Church. Um, and, but but here you see Edward the Sixth comes up and he seems to uh, significantly have a, a leaning, a bent, an incline towards um, a Reformation doctrine. And so um, during uh, Edward the Sixth uh, reign. Uh, Thomas Cranmer did uh, a lot of work to set the foundation for um, the, the Protestant Reformation in England. He, he started changing a lot of the things that he saw occurring within the church. Up to that point, it looked very much like the Catholic Church, but just had their king as its leader. Uh, Henry VIII is a leader instead of the Pope. But, but once Edward VI is, is in place, um, he starts uh, composing the first and the second edition of the Common Book of Prayer. Um, he publishes his homilies in 1547, requiring uh, the, the, the uh, clergy in England to preach uh, Protestant uh, uh, doctrine. Um, and, uh, and then he also produces the 42 articles about a year later, uh, and he moved the church uh, significantly towards uh, Calvinism. Um, so in 1553, King Edward VI died, and uh, both Edward and Cranmer, Edward and Thomas, I guess I should use first names on both counts, um, but uh, Edward and, uh, and Thomas supported Lady Jane Grey as the new sovereign. She was even more Protestant than Edward VI, but um, they, they had changed the rules of succession so that she could uh, be the new monarch. Uh, but she ends up being deposed nine days later and replaced by Mary Tudor, who was very staunchly Catholic. And uh, she was also the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, um, the woman that had been displaced by Henry VIII. So, um, so she uh, comes into, uh, into play and she is staunchly Catholic. Um, almost immediately, uh, Parliament repealed uh, Henry VIII and Edward VI acts and reintroduced Catholic heresy laws. Uh, she relentlessly and severely persecuted um, uh, Protestants um, throughout her reign, and uh, that gave her the nickname Bloody Mary. So that's how she got the nickname, was by persecuting Protestants and Protestantism uh, in England during that time period. Cranmer at that time was charged with treason in November of 1553. Uh, he spent two years in prison. Uh, the verdict was reached in 1556. Um, and, and during that trial, it was very much uh, the intention uh, of the trial to humiliate him. Uh, and so they humiliated him. Uh, they, uh, the verdict was that he was to be burned at the stake. And um, at the time, he hoping to avoid being burned at the stake, he uh, became convinced that maybe he should support, you know, you know, now that I think about it, I, I, I want to throw in kind of my two cents of, of um, <laughs> my two cents of, of commentary um, by shading or coloring the history of it. But, you know, as he's sitting there in jail for two years, he, he thinks, you know, uh, maybe, um, maybe I should support a Catholic ruler. I mean, they are the ruler after all. And uh, maybe I should walk back a lot of these reforms that I helped him push forward and uh, so he signs a, uh, a recantation. Uh, he signs a letter that says, I confess, and this is a quote, I confess and believe in one holy Catholic visible church. I recognize as its supreme head upon earth the Bishop of Rome and the Pope and Vicar of Christ to whom all the faithful are bound subject. So he wrote and signed that letter as a confession of him kind of stepping back from his uh, Reformation, uh, you know, uh, movements and, um, and, and kind of towards Catholicism and in hope that he would not have to be burned at the stake. Um, they heard it, they received it, uh, but they decided, you know what, Thomas Cramner really should be uh, punished for all that he did to the church. So he's still subject to, uh, to being burned at the stake. And as he sat there the night before, he was going to be given one last opportunity to speak before the people, um, you know, as an opportunity to declare his faith in Catholic doctrine and to hopefully 
earn for himself forgiveness or absolve himself of all the damage he had done just before he's burned at the stake. That night he sat at his desk with two sermons in front of him. One of them uh, was uh, declaring uh, that the Pope was the vicar of Christ and the other uh, sermon that he had there declared the Pope as Christ's enemy and the Antichrist. And so he, uh, you know, wrestled over that all night long. In the morning, when it was his turn to speak, he took out a piece of paper and he read, I come to the great thing that troubles my conscience more than any other thing that I ever did in my life. All such bills which I have written and signed with my own hand are untrue. And as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and Antichrist with all his false doctrine. And as for the sacrament, and, and as he continued kind of, you know, saying all these things, uh, he was dragged away. That was the last thing that they heard him say uh, in, in the church there. They dragged him out and took him to where he would be burned at the stake. The fire was already lit. And as he approached the fire, um, he put his hands to the fire, the hand with which he signed uh, the the uh, the letter saying that the Pope was was uh, that everyone is subject and faithful to the Pope or should be. Um, he stuck that hand, the hand that he signed with, into the fire, and he yelled out, uh, "This hand has offended." And then, uh, as he died, he said, "Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." So um, I. I'm trying not to kind of project, I probably already have, because it's really hard not to project some measure of perspective and bias into uh, who he was. Um, but, you know, he, he did seem to uh, fulfill a role um, that later was very helpful to um, Protestants within, uh, within England. Um, he really helped shape uh, what became known as the Anglican Church. And um, in, in outside of England, it's the Episcopalian Church. You know, the New World version of Anglicanism is Episcopalianism. And so um, uh, he helped to shape that uh, for what it was. And um, uh, but, uh, you know, he, he does kind of seem to go back and forth throughout his, the course of his whole life on, um, you know, just kind of uh, yielding to, submitting to, acquiescing to, the will of whatever sovereign is threatening him at the moment. Um, I would I would hesitate to judge him personally, number one, because I don't have to. Um, that's the Lord's to judge, right? Um, but I, I would say for myself, I would hope that the Lord, by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would help to me to stand firm to, to what it is that uh, the Bible teaches, no matter what the threats are that come against my life. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm better than him. I don't know any of us that, that would think we're better than others, but yeah, I hope we wouldn't. Um, but, um, but I don't know if I want that set of my testimony, you know? Um, when I'm gone, man, he, he vacillated a lot. Um, if anybody threatened him, he would cave. I, I don't think that's a good testimony to have. Um, and, uh, but um, it's commendable that, that in the end, um, he's, you know, when, when he took a stand, he took a stand on the stand that he took, because I think that that's the truth that he stood on in the end. And I'm glad for him that he did. And um, and so, before we kind of conclude this section, I'd like to take a moment to talk about two other uh, Protestant reformers that um, died in the execution, the persecution of, of uh, Mary Tudor. Um, so, one of them is called Nicholas Ridley, and the other one is called Hugh Latimer. And uh, Ridley was Thomas Cranmer's chaplain when he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he became the Bishop of London, uh, and he helped write the, common, the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, he redesigned the interior layout of English churches, removing the old stone altars and, and instead putting uh, simple wooden tables uh, for the serving of communion. He was responsible, Ridley was responsible for shifting the responsibilities of, um, of, the, uh, the, lay, of the clergy uh, of the priests to work that would occur outside, more pastoral work ministering to the needs of the people. And so um, he, was, he was very much used in that way uh, during the time of uh, Thomas Cranmer's uh, uh, officiating as the Archbishop of Canterbury during Henry VIII's rule. 
Hugh Latimer was a passionate preacher of Catholicism, and he would give these kinds of sermons, these lectures attacking Luther's doctrine. And one day, uh, Thomas Bilney, who was the person in charge of the Protestant um, movement in Cambridge, uh, he heard uh, Hugh Latimer preaching against Luther. And afterwards, he approached him and he asked if he would hear his confession. He said to Hugh Latimer, would you hear my confession? Hugh Latimer thought, oh, this guy... I converted him to Catholicism. Uh, I would love to hear uh, your confession, sir. And so they, they went to meet, but uh, Thomas Bilney's confession uh, was really a very uh, uh, gently uh, and carefully worded message of the comfort of the scriptures, of the grace of God, and, and, and of the mercy of the Lord, and, and how God's word brings comfort and grace and strength to, to a, a heart. And it so moved Hugh Latimer that he uh, was moved to tears and he converted to Protestantism uh, from that confession. And so uh, he left there uh, and became an avid preacher against uh, Catholic doctrine. Um, he preached boldly and in 1530 he even uh, gave a sermon before Henry VIII condemning the use of violence to defend and protect God's word. Henry VIII had a great deal of respect uh, for him uh, for doing that and made uh, Hugh Latimer one of his uh, chief uh, advisors and counselors. But when Henry VIII started walking back his stance towards Catholicism away from Protestantism, uh, Hugh Latimer uh, opposed that. And because of that, Henry VIII sentenced him to house arrest, which lasted for about six years. Um, when uh, Henry VIII's son, Edward VI, became king, um, he uh, was released from house arrest and he became one of the more prominent uh, preachers in England until uh, Mary Tudor became queen. And then uh, he fell afoul of her uh, persecution. Um, he was imprisoned, he was tried, and he was sentenced to death uh, with Nicholas Ridley. So um, you can look this up in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, the field of execution, Ridley arrived first. And when Hugh Latimer arrived, Ridley said to him, Be of good heart, brother, for God will either assuage the fury of the flame or else strengthen us to abide it. So they knelt, they prayed, they listened to an exhortation from a preacher. That was the custom when you were being executed for heresy. And then afterwards they were wrapped with an iron chain to the stake around their waists and as the fire uh, was lit Latimer said be of good comfort Mr. Ridley and play the man we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust never shall be put out as the fire rose Latimer cried O oh, father of heaven receive my soul and died uh, Ridley hung on until the lower half of his body uh, was almost completely burned before he passed away. And so these were the testimony uh, of these two men uh, that, that here uh, died under the persecution of, of Bloody Mary. And, um, and, and I love that story. <laughs> uh, I, I, it makes me want to read it again, uh, at least uh, Latimer's quote, I'm going to read it again. Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. And you know, I think it's it's so important that we be a light shining and we, we don't often think of the personal cost that it might be to us to, to be a light shining in this world. Um, but we have a responsibility for it and towards it. In just a few years, Elizabeth I would become queen and uh, she would move the entire uh, country and the church back towards Protest Protestantism, uh, revise Thomas Cranmer's 42 articles into 39 articles adopt his Book of Common Prayers as the uh, guide to worship, and, uh, and and things would be set in that direction uh, and, and kept in that direction for a very long time. But as we kind of come to the to the close of, of this small, short session on church history, um, man, are we being a testimony? Are we being a witness? Um, are we being... Uh, are we standing firm by the truths that God has taught us, by the doctrines that God has taught us? Or are we quick to vacillate, to go back and forth. Um, if, if anything that we say or believe is being threatened, are we 
fast to uh, pull back and, and just, you know, yield it? Or will we stand by the truth? Um, in, in times uh, like the ones in which we live, um, considering the, the challenges that we face, which, which are unique to us, you know, um, are we holding fast to the truth? Or is the pressure of this world uh, something that will uh, get us to a point where we will easily uh, give in uh, and, 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 and backpedal on the faith that we've had, the trust that we've had in the Lord? Um, so let's pray and that will conclude this session. In the next session, uh, we're going to look at Christianity in the modern world. And, and that will be kind of like a fast forward session. Um, of, of what took place uh, afterwards. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for your truth. And I pray, Lord, even with these uh, small little uh, bites, Lord, of history, um, that you would uh, speak to our hearts and, and not just our minds, not just uh, um, open our, our, our minds and teach us new things intellectually, Lord, but I pray that spiritually um, our hearts would be um, strengthened and nourished and fed um, Lord, that we would be encouraged in our walk, uh, that we would be faithful to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.